I just wanted to bring us back to metadata just for, a, you know, a few minutes, I promise. Um, and before I do that kind of embedded, and some of the things I have to say is that um, I wanted to go back to something Dr. Gibbs said earlier, and I think it was this really interesting connectedness. So he said, um, he was just talking about the different sites and, okay, the metadata and um, what I wrote down, and I might have it wrong, was like, okay, well, before we had digital technology, we had to categorize everything, right? So we could find stuff, and so that was kind of why it seems kind of boring, but I did want to just mention, because I've been doing a little bit of um, history on history of the book, right? And so um, I just thought it was just a fun, a fun aside note just to mention that um, I think his name, um, Anthony, who's in library school, right? Pianzi is his name. And so in the 1930s, like mid-1800s, not 1900s, um, he was a, um, let's say I wrote it down, I wrote it down. He was the uh, assistant librarian at the British Museum, and he um, was later the keeper of books. And so he created, in essence, what is the first like cataloging system. I think it's called like Pionzi's 91 rules. And so there were a code of like 91 different questions folks would have to answer in order to like catalog the book so that people could find them. And so in addition to like things like um, author, title, right, which we, which we see today, there was other fascinating things like um, any imperfections in the book, right? Was there any kind of imperfections? Um, the quality of paper, for example, that it was printed on. And so it is from those 91 rules or codes that we get the modern day cataloging metadata system, right? And so um, we don't have 91, right? <laughs> Amy narrowed it down for us, but I just thought that was interesting to kind of give that, you know, just a side note on that really interesting way of how we get to this metadata that, that we're using today in the digital, right? Um, and so besides that, um, I, before we also get into like the importance of metadata, because yesterday I think that we spent a good part of, of the afternoon talking about um, interrogating metadata, right? Especially with the subject terms and what is the, how, how useful are these controlled vocabularies to like define our communities, right? But there's still some, I think there's still some ways that metadata can be very helpful in telling our stories. Um, and so, yes, our stories, the interconnectedness of our stories come alive, right, through these different digital mediums. Um, some of the examples I showed yesterday, but also all of the examples Dr. Gibbs showed right before lunch is real, are really exciting ways of the way that these stories come to life. But I just want to reiterate again that it's never either or, and so that metadata also plays this important role in making these stories come to life, right? I like to think of it as the magic behind the scenes, right? That optimizes the discoverability of these projects and what and, and for researchers that are looking for it, right? And so if we think about how important metadata is, not we can think about its importance not just in like, oh, fitting in these prescriptive models like subject terms, but I'd also like to encourage you guys to think of the metadata as a as maybe the first step in telling the stories you want to tell, right? I think the what the Omeka page looks like is one aspect, but the metadata is also one aspect, aside from the kind of issues of controlled vocabularies in the subject, right? So um, the first thing that, uh, and we went over these with Amy, but there's just a few things that I want to mention before um, we wrap up the metadata. The first thing is the title, right? Um, and this is not scientific, right? But I said in my notes, um, you want less than the description field, um, <laughs> but more than, what did I say? Let me see, how did, but more than generic. Right? So you don't, you don't want as much of the stuff that you have in the description, but you just don't want a generic title. So for example, um, wedding photo. 
you know, that's, that might not be the best title for an image that you upload because at the end of the day, there's a lot of photos, right? And so maybe a person's name, a date, okay, wedding photo of X, Y date, right? And, and I'll say a little bit later why that's so important. Um, a letter, right? Um, correspondence seems to be a lot of the different documents um, especially when we're working with historical documents, right? There's these correspondence. So maybe it's letter from X to Y dated, fill in the blank. And that's right? all in the title? That's all in the title, right? Letter from Margie, from Margie to Carmen dated <laughs> uh, August 14th, yes, um, 2019. And I'll tell you why that's important. So that's, I mean, and we can have a discussion that's my recommendation, and that's what I've done as I've digitized histor historical documents in the Center for Southwest Research, right? That's how long the title is. Um, does that make sense? And so, and that is important because, so we won't go over every single field, but as you're starting to tell these stories, the description becomes even more important because that's your free text, right? That's where we didn't, Brad, do you know if there's a character limit in the descriptor? I don't know. Okay, but I think we agreed that it's probably pretty high even if there isn't a character limit, maybe. Um, so if we're thinking about that, that's where your narrative starts to come together. That is where your stories are creating these interconnected um, webs, right? So for example, um, letter dated X, Letter from X to Y dated, you know, 1850 um, regarding not sending money home, why he's still working in Texas, and that he hopes to see, you know, Eliza next month. Well, that's just one, that is the description, right? You give as much as you can, um, even where it's sent from. The reason the title is so important is that in my experience, as you start digitizing, you'll start putting together like a puzzle. All of a sudden, you find that letter, right? Oh, so Carmen, thank you for your letter dated, you know, August 14th. Down the line, I might find that original letter. And so in the description, I always like to try to piece together these puzzles and then I could put, see also letter dated, X, Y, and Z from Carmen, right? So you put dates in the title and then you reiterate in the description. Yes, right. So there is some overlap, exactly. So sometimes my title is the first sentence or line in my description. Okay. Yes, yeah. And that's the same thing um, if you think about marriage photos, right? So I think there might have been some pictures of, of marriage photos, but what if you all, so that's an item. But what if you find the marriage license as another item that gets uploaded, right? Or maybe a church record. Wouldn't it be awesome to try to connect these stories, right? And you do that by referencing in your description, see also, right, or something. And so that's why the titles are important, and that's also why the descriptions are so important. And you can see even through these examples, we start painting a more lived experience of these, of these histories, right? Which I think we've all been talking about, the lived experiences, the histories. And so in that sense, um, the stories come together through these prescribed fields, right? Through these metadata. Yeah, Shane. So in the description field, like you say, the see also phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, can you put active links in your description, or is there a different field in Omega which, where you can put like links to associated items? Okay. Like, like you know, anyway, yeah. Yeah, Brad. <laughs> I, I, I yeah, I know you did. So, in the description, if they say, if we say something like C also, can you put a link to that item in the description? In a generic text field, yes. Yes. Yes, so you can. Okay. So that'll be a really nice way to kind of connect to that other document. I mean, think of random things like census records, right? What if there's a set and then a family and you can place them, right? So on the one hand, I like to think of these things like um, census records, birth certificates, 
it gets, licensed as this official narrative of the state. But if you can collect that, connect it to these unofficial narratives of letters and photographs, right? It's kind of connect, bringing these official and unofficial narratives together to paint this real, you know, to paint the lived experience. Yeah. I was just going to say that for those of you that are that are going out in the community and collecting, sometimes these narratives may be right in front of your face and you may not realize it. An example being, how many times have you seen a collection and the person that's keeping them already has them, like everything to do with whatever is in this box, everything to do with whatever yes. else is in another box or another folder. Often they will actually do what's called clumping uh -huh. and clump them together into sort of the narrative. Everything that's in this is about this side of the family or everything that's in this is about so and so. Yes. Yes. We tend to, just as humans, we tend to do that this naturally and yeah. that can actually help you. If, if you start feeling stressed about, oh gosh, how am I going to organize this? Right. Or how, you know, how am I supposed to know what kind of a narrative this is telling? Often the narrative is right in front of you with simply the way it's already organized. With the way it's organized. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, some other questions or comments about these fields. So I just wanted to take a few moments just to kind of take us back to like metadata, right? And so I know we kind of interrogated it yesterday with the subject fields and the Library of Congress, which are important fields, right? But, but think about the description as a way to elaborate that story and make connections, right? All right. Passing it over to Amy. Other people's stuff. Okay. 
Okay, so that's kind of how we're going to try to address both of those pieces from the perspective of the people who are participating in this project. Okay, so so to to go back from there though, in general, um, when we talk about copyright, a lot of times people get really tense, and it's like all these rules and it's scary. Um, but really, the original intention was to foster creativity, right? It was to support artists and creative people to be able to basically earn money for a period of time from their work. So it gave them, it gave the creator rights for a period of time over their work, how it was used, how it was distributed and sold. So that's kind of the intention. And I think that's kind of a nice idea. So, if, so I like to go into the conversation remembering that, right? That this isn't, this isn't <laughs> meant to be about lawsuits, even if it's become, you know, a lot about that. Um, to, to think about it as how do we foster creativity while at the same time promote fair, fairness, right? And the ability to share. So we're sort of, in, those two goals are intention. Does that make sense? So, <laughs> if you own copyright to an item, this is what you own. The right to reproduce, distribute, perform, or display the work, or create derivative works. And that's, might be, the language might be a little confusing, but does anybody have a, a comment about, um, let's say, an interesting case that they heard of that addresses these rights. Four notes in a song that was just the subject of a. That's exactly the one I was thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, especially now with electronic media, um, the whole derivative work thing has become way more um, thorny. I love that word this week, apparently. Um, right, I, and, and I, there's a, there are a lot of cases about music in, ter, uh, for, in the derivative works because um, what falls into that category is like parodies. So when someone writes a parody of a song, is that a derivative work? Is it not? That's, that's usually, um, parodies are usually protected under another rule that we'll talk about in a minute. But, well, yes, no, go ahead. Well, what really comes to mind too, in terms of images, is logos. You know, they can... yes, yes. Companies love to protect their logos and sue people for misusing them, right? And then there's the oh, go ahead. There's a lot on artists, right? And I'll send you one on because you're a fan of George O'Keefe. Uh -huh. Oh, piece. great, it's, great. It was like standard reading. Yeah, and I saw piece. one example where somebody had used other people's tweets to create art, and there was a lawsuit about that, like, did they have the right to, so, it's a whole, it's, I mean, we could, again, talk for days and days about this, um, <laughs> but let's, maybe you can tell me, just over the last five minutes, what concerns have come to your mind about this project, when, when you think about copyright, yeah. Well, Sorry. I'm thinking of some photos that were taken during the WPA time that do involve the community of Costa and Pinasco as well. Can we, uh, what's the term, download them onto our site? Uh, how can that be done without violating any copyright rules? That's that's a great issue. So that's, that's about how do I use someone else's stuff or how do I determine whether I can use Okay, good. Patricia? I think it's pretty similar, but um, this semester I'm going to embark on an oral history project with students. So 20 students are going to be interviewing 20 community members. And so um, what we want to upload are the audio files to create a website that will become part of a museum exhibit. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I'm concerned about is if we just kind of dump them into that general item, where you put all the items, 
that anybody can pull them and interpret them in a different way before the students have a chance to and before community members have a chance to. So how would you manage, how would we manage that? Okay, okay, those are great questions. So, so I'm gonna address Patricia's issue first because it's a little bit different, right? The stuff that you are creating you or someone at, in that project owns that. You're the creator of it. Um, <clears throat> so, if as the creator, anything that you put on the internet, you lose control of. And that's just, that's just a fact. And so, I would say if you have concerns about that, um, do that interpretation first before you actually make the audio available so that so that you you are releasing all of the material together and then when people do what they're inevitably going to do um, at least your perspective is out there so i guess i mean terms yeah that totally makes sense okay. and um as far as this project goes like for me i feel like i mean it's not the work of today but maybe in a future meeting is like what agreements or norms do we have as a group about stuff like right. that? Because right. if we're just a working group and we're all editors, I think that we could come up with those norms um, and then if somebody were to break one of them, then we could hold each other accountable. Right. Yeah. Um, and you can also do things like consent forms, which I think there's some in the packet, is that right? Some examples. Um, and, and I can talk a little bit maybe about different ways that you can license your content, Creative Commons licenses, yeah. I'm sure everybody's heard of those. That's a that's a really good way. And again, it's it's voluntary, right? Like you're sort of on the honor system that people are gonna honor what you've asked them to do by putting a Creative Commons license on it. But it's better than not doing it, right? Yeah. Jean? And just to clarify what Patricia's question, and this is a technical one for you, which is that there is that distinction that we're gonna be able to clear up, which is you could put all that in the archive and set it to a setting where only your students, say as editors, have access to it to work on it, and nobody else will have access to it. So there's that safety in the system for just sheer that length. To put it in the archive doesn't mean now that it's out there in the world. So technically, that will be something that you will have managed. And is that something that we could like call you or somebody else as we get into the project to get? more support on, or? Yeah, probably more like Fred will always do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, I mean, but yes, there, we will have, the, yeah, the will be there to have that for, right. for those kind of questions. But yeah, so I, I was hearing a technical issue in your question, so I just wanted to let you know, like, it's putting awesome. it in the archive, you're going to have control over all that access. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and that's that's a really important distinction. So, so when I said, when you put it on the internet, what I meant was when you make it openly available on the internet, yeah. right, then anybody can access it. And that came up a little bit earlier with images, right? Somebody, someone was talking about um, being able to download images at certain resolutions and being able to control what people can do with it. And again, you can to some extent, but <laughs> I always like to, to emphasize, like, that's always a possibility. So if that's a really big concern, that you don't, you know, that, that it's more important to not have someone misuse your image than it is to have it widely available, then don't put it on the internet, right? So something else that I've seen in our community is there's some tension in our community, specifically around our fiestas. And so um, our fiestas has just become a nonprofit and people who are part of that group have these beautiful archival photos, but what they're doing is they're putting these really garish, like, copyright of mm -hmm. like a specific mm -hmm. family member. Yeah. yeah, watermarks, there you go. And uh, for me, it kind of defeats the purpose of sharing because though that is what's most prominent. And so I've been trying to help work with people and figure out a way to help them archive their photos best. Right, right. Yeah. So I just wanna sort of piggyback on what you're saying that the, the big sort of impetus for this project is about sharing and about how can an archive um, be inspiration for other people's cultural production and creative expression. So um, using, you know, sort of that that uh, that intention, the the tension with I want to keep it 
Uh, I want to keep ownership of it, and that usually has to do with monetizing things. Uh, and if that's the case, then maybe this isn't the right platform for you. You know, let's try and share those things where we can say we want to inspire people, right. we want to uh, engage communities, and especially youth in cultural heritage and the importance of cultural heritage, and kind of let them go crazy with it, uh, right. as opposed to, you know, creating something that's more restrictive because it's usually yep. for the reason of monetization or sometimes privacy or other people. Right, right. Many reasons why cultural things like But that anyway, so right. I think, you know, let's try and keep that the focus of what we are sharing. Okay, mm -hmm. I, and I think that's fine. I just, a lot of times people don't, um, people who don't have a lot of technical experience don't understand that people can yeah. take your images off of the open internet and put them on mugs. <laughs> yeah. Right, we had a, had a project that we worked on where that was that was the concern that the these images were going to be taken and put on Zazzle, you know, or, or Cafe Press, and people were going to make mugs and T-shirts and make a lot of money. And you know, I I can't tell you that won't happen. So that's the only reason why I start off with that. Yes. Uh, you can safeguard some by uh, putting a watermark. Um, you don't have to have it go across the whole image, um, but also you can. Uh, do the DPI on it uh, low enough mm -hmm. that you can see it, looks okay, but if you try to bring it out, even do a, an 8 by 10 on it, it it's just going to fall right. apart. Right, and we out. talked about how you yeah. know, 72 pixels per inch looks great on the web, but it doesn't print very well. So mm -hmm. that's, that's definitely an option, but again, and I'm sorry if I'm harping on this, but people really need to understand if it's on the internet, people can use it for it's whatever they free. want. Actually, encountered pictures that I've downloaded that I couldn't upload again. Mm -hmm. There's like a protection on them. Okay, I mm -hmm. don't. So yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Just Google that. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, in film work, there are releases that must be signed for someone to use someone's private property. When that's not done, that's when it goes legal. And we process a few of those cases. But I want to ask a question. What, you're, what we're talking about. Who had a question about, who was talking about the WPA and the CCC camps? I've got the perfect, I'll send it to you. Great. The CCC camp that was on Ghost Ranch. Mm -hmm. A gentleman came, he had researched it, took him out of the site. He's got stuff from the 20s and 30s all the way up from the inception of WC, or WPA project. It's beautiful. Old pictures are gorgeous. Uh -huh. There was one on Ghost Ranch. We have all the information. I'll, I'll email it to you. Yes. Um, well, something I'm wondering is, is for this archive, is the point of it for people to be able to use these images, right. or is it just for people to be able to look at? And if they do see something that they can't download or use, is there going to be an easy way for them to contact who they need to contact? Is that part That's of That's a this? great question. Mm -hmm. <coughs>
do you want commercial uses? Yes or no? Right? And then there's like some questions for each of those. So I'm just going to say, yes, people can adapt, right? They can change my, my item and share it as long as they share theirs, right? As long as they keep passing it on. And, but I don't want them to make any money from it. And then it shows me this is the li license that I should use, right? And then I can put that in one of my metadata fields, right? This item is shared under an attribution, right? They have to say that it's mine, that I made it. Non-commercial, so they can't sell it. And they have to be willing to share what they do with it. That's the license. So that is that relatively clear, given that the probably the first time some people are hearing this. So are we creating a license? Yes. And so is there a document or a so um, there's there is there's some there's like a little icon that you can uh, these little icons right mm -hmm. and or you can link you can put a link there to this page right. and that's how you let people know that you're okay with them doing these things and not these other things with it okay and so you can explore this creativecommons.org mm -hmm. and I put a link to that in the workbook. I did not put a link to it. I'll fix that. But it's right here. It talks a little bit about it. So, so I like creative comments, right? Because like Mimi said, the whole point of this project is we're trying to share stuff. Um, you can also use um, traditional copyright. And that's more what this handout is talking about. Um, and this, this again, is gonna, we're going to segue a little bit into other people's stuff with this, right? This sheet talks about the different kinds of right statements when you know who owns the copyright, and that might be you, right? I think the first one... <clears throat> I thought there was one on here that was, this is this is my item and this is the copyright notice that I'm going to put on it. But again, this is a website, it's called writestatements.org, and you can explore that. If I can spell it, right? And they provide more information than can just fit on this one sheet. But this is helpful because it talks you through the decision making, right? Does this license fit my situation or not? For many different circumstances. When you know who owns it, when no one owns it, when you don't know who owns it, or when you're not sure. And again, there's, there's a bunch of these, so take extras if you want to. Um, and oh, I should say this stuff, all of these things can go in that rights metadata field, right? That's what it's for. Uh, now, I hope that this um, is going to address your question about determining rights. Is that helpful? Okay. Could okay. you say just something about public domain to, to sure. ask a question about the, the, uh, the what, why did Congress? Yeah, so government documents, right, anything produced or published by the government is not copyrightable. That's for everyone to use because we pay for it, so, so it belongs to us. Um, so if anyone tries to tell you that you can't do something because whatever, if, if it was published by the U.S. government, that's, it's fully useful. Is it better to link to those images that are in the Library of Congress or to uh, do what John said? Fred, what do you think about that? That's okay. Uh, the question is, is it better to link to an item that's at the, at the Library of Congress or download it and put it into the archive? What do you think? something that you want to use a lot in your 
site or you see other people with their sites would want to use, so you might put it in a general pool. Um, then it's worth maybe putting in the collection if it's going to get that much use and readings. Um, so really, I think it depends on the situation and how, how much it's going to circulate uh, on the different sites. So it's not very much. You'll probably just keep the one with the official copy of the Library of Congress and move to it. But if it's really widely used, it might be easier to have it here because we can then you have a little bit more control over how you display it. And you can also, um, when you're attaching uh, the media, instead of uploading a, a scan, right, you can uh, put in a URL. So that will create an item in the archive, but it will have a link out to the item on the Library of Congress, for example. Yeah. Just as an addendum to that for a good practice is that Library of Congress is one of the few sites I would actually trust to link to, because they actually have permalinks for every single one of their resources. So you know that uh, unless the US government falls, that probably it's, that link's going to be good. But that's not necessarily true for smaller institutions or other resources. So in those cases, if you want to make sure that you have it, you might want to download it. Yeah, that's another good reason for getting a copy, right? If you're worried that it's not going to be preserved where it is. Only the Library of Congress has a really good digital preservation program, I hope. But not every site does. So, um, so again, like we could talk about this all day. I feel like I'm just scratching the surface, but other questions? Oh, sorry, Ellen. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, in the case, especially in the case of using material from other archives, the copyright holder and the right for permission to use maybe two separate entities. Um, so, for example, and actually, you could even have more than that, but the Taos Woodblocks thing that I used just to seed it, so the permission for use came from the Center for Southwest Research. They gave me permission to reproduce those. The copyright for the prints came from Jane Abrams, but the copyright on the woodblocks and the original content came from the estate of the child of the man who published the paper in Taos. So I got all three of those permissions, okay. but the CSWR doesn't hold the copyright, but they still had to give release. So for instance, with the um, FSA photographs, in the Library of Congress, there is a line that's like, credit the FSA OWI, and then there's a record number. So you would want to take that and include it in, you know, include it in your description or include it in your uh, in, in your right. Yeah. They may not have a copyright because it's public domain, but you're still um, you still need to repeat the permission. Same thing with the Creative Commons. You you need to include that language there yes. as you're using it from somebody else's. Okay. And the the issue with the center, a lot of the the Center for Southwest Research here. Um, a lot of the stuff has been digitized here, so the center owns the right to the digital image, which is what you used on the website, but not the copyright to the physical item, which is what we talked about yesterday that was really confusing for people, but you can see why it's an important distinction. Yeah, so the center, for example, could have given Alan permission to display the digital image because they created it, but not to like make another copy of the wood block itself, because, because they don't own the right to let someone do that. Um, and we can talk a little bit about fair use. I'm reminded as I'm looking at my notes here. And again, fair use is very complicated. It's very, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of gray areas. There's a lot of contentiousness. Um, but in general, if you're using something, one of, one of the pieces of fair use is what you're using it for, right? And if you're gonna sell it, if you're gonna put it on a t-shirt and sell it, that's less likely to be a fair use of someone else's material than if you're using it, let's say, in an art history class to show the image to the students for educational purposes. So that's the first bullet point here. I don't know if you guys can see this. Right, the purpose and character of the use is one of the four points for fair use. The second one is the nature. 
So, and this could actually be really crucial to this project because a lot of the items that might come up might be unpublished. And so an unpublished work, a, a use of an unpublished work is less likely to be fair than the use of a published work, which is weird, right? Because if it's unpublished, then, you know, fewer people have gotten to see it. But that's, that's point two. Does anybody, do you have, guys have any insight into that? Why an unpublished work is considered more protected? Why? No. Okay. So, it just is. <laughs> We're just going to accept that. Um, the third bullet is the portion, right? And not just how much, right? Not just, like, some people, I've heard arguments like, well, I only use 10 seconds of the movie. But if it's the 10 seconds where the murderer is revealed, right, that's the substantive, right? It, that's an integral, that's a spoiler, right? So using that is le less likely to be considered a fair use than another part that isn't as crucial to the work as a whole. And then the first, the fourth point is the market effect. Is it is your use of this item going to affect sales or or other forms of revenue flowing to the person who owns the item or created it? The person who holds the rights, which might be the person who created it, might not. Is that is that good for like a 30 second fair use? Summary. And again, there's lots more resources. There's this horrible thing here, which is um, from the Copyright Office. And it looks really sweet, like it's laid out really nicely, but it's dense. But if you're really curious, you can go there and get it from the horse's mouth. There's also this nice, this is really nice actually. I just found this the other day. And it's a set of five lessons on copyright. <coughs> And so they go over different aspects of it, and then they have little quizzes. So you can see if you understood what they were talking about. Um, this is from uh, Wisconsin Madison. So, and you can navigate through it down here at the bottom. Okay. So those are some resources that you can explore on your own, and I will make sure that there's a link in here to the Creative Commons licenses as well that we talked about. Okay. <laughs> so. Let's talk a little bit about web accessibility. And this is the other, this other handout, the white one. And you'll see in the handbook, I put in big letters, most of this is out of our control. Because, as you'll see if you start to read over the handout, a lot of the points that they're addressing have to do with the way the website is built, right? The, um, the what, what they're calling the semantic structure, Right, which means how the different pieces of text are coded in the template that's going to display the website. Um, the, the stuff about color contrast for people with color blindness or other kinds of visual perceptual disabilities. And we can't really do anything about that unless we're involved in the design process with Fred, which we might be. So that might come in later. But in terms of us as editors, uploading items. We don't really have a lot of control over some of this. So the pieces that I want to focus on are the first little set of bullet points, which I reproduced. Right? So we want to write clearly. We want our text to be clear. We want to spell things correctly. We want to use punctuation and complete sentences <coughs> to make sure that the most, the highest number of users can benefit from our descriptions, right? And that goes for our metadata, like the description field, but it also goes for when we're building pages and we're telling our stories. We wanna be sure that that's accessible to people who maybe, you know, either have trouble reading either because it's not their language or because they, for whatever reason, the clearer we can be, the better. Um, what else does it say? The, oh, it has a section over here about links, making sure links are descriptive, like don't put a link that says click here, 
<laughs> and the reason for that is because some people who are visually impaired use what is called a screen reader, which basically reads text to them, and it's going to read click here, and they won't know what that goes to, right? So that's why, and I tried to demonstrate that in this document, like my links tell you what they go to, right? Like this link goes to the web accessibility evaluation tool, <coughs> right? I didn't say click here for the web accessibility evaluation tool. Uh, what else is on here? Um, oh, captioning. Captioning and transcripts, and Fred showed a great example of that right before lunch, right? Where the video was broken into chunks, and then below each chunk was the transcript of what was said in, the, in that section. That's fantastic. And as he pointed out, because search engines can find it, that's great. But also, if you can't hear the video, it's great to be able to, or if, if you're like me, and you can read faster than the video can play, and you don't want to like sit there for 30 minutes and listen to the whole thing, you want to read it in 10 minutes, I probably shouldn't confess that, but um, it's nice to have a transcript, right? So um, it's also hard and costly to have a transcript, but it's important. Same thing with captions. And a lot of the software that will caption automatically is not very good. So if you use that, you need to always make sure that it's done it correctly, that what the caption says is actually what's being said in the video. And, oh, alt text. Fred, did we, did we find out where we can enter that on our items or on the, oh, on no, the page? No, that's okay. I think it's under the advanced tab. Okay. In the, in the item or when we add it to the page? You know what, I saw, I saw it and then I, I couldn't tell you where it is again. But okay. I, I guess I was editing an attachment, editing the template. Okay, so it's probably when you add your item to a page. So when you see that, alt or alternative text, there's a really good explanation here of how to fill that in. And it's not the same as describing the item, right? We don't say, this is a picture of my grandfather who Right? It's not a description of the picture, it's a description of the purpose that the image serves on the page, if that makes sense. <clears throat> okay? Amy, can I share a little? Um, Absolutely. Just if, you know, as a shortcut, uh, YouTube's got a pretty good closed caption thing, so you can upload a video to YouTube set it to close caption itself, edit it by hand, like Amy said, because otherwise, especially if there's any non-English words or if the speaker is English mouth, um, you know, edit it by hand, but then you can copy and paste the transcript out of the YouTube editor. So you can get your full transcript. Wow. Um, you can also do it the other way around, that if you have a transcript, you can throw it into YouTube and it'll close caption. Uh, pretty well, pretty pretty closely to the video. So that's that's a really nice free tool that kind of works well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean that's that's great as long as you like you're saying do your due diligence and make sure that it isn't putting some weird random thing on there. And I have seen <laughs> I like to watch movies with the captions on, and you can see some funny stuff sometimes. I don't know if anybody else has done that, but. Um, I think, again, that's as far as I'm going to delve into this, which it, is it could be a whole day, right? Um, unless people have specific questions about accessibility. Did you, did you have anything to add about the alt text or uh, <laughs> description? So those descriptions would be uh, for people who are blind, right? The, the alt text, well, yes, or someone who isn't loading in for whatever reason, because so, their connection so is slow. So it might say, instead of whose grandfather it is, it's a photograph of a man standing in front of a house, you know, so you're describing to somebody who, who can't see it. As oh, but, yeah, but that's not what alt text is. That's oh, the so metadata that? description. So the alt, so where does that go? That's the, like in your metadata, that's the description of the photo, right? But um, <clears throat> I'm going to just read from this, because they explain it really well. 
So it, pre it presents the, the function, not necessarily a description of an image. If you had to remove the image, what text would you put in its place? Right? So it's what is this image, why are you putting this image here? What are you trying to, to show the user? If it's a decorative or an illustration, then you should not put all text in. Because everything that you put in there is going to get read to the user through the screen reader. So you don't want a lot of long descriptions. You want them to understand why this picture is here. If that, I know it's a fine distinction. Can it, does anybody have any? <laughs> what? Yeah, like this image shows what life was like in the, right, the, what the text is about. Right. So if it's decorative, it's not, you don't even bother putting it off. Right, you can leave it blank. Yeah. And, and like I said, the, the sheet describes it, and this site is great. So they have a lot more stuff on their site. If you want to delve into that. about the software you can use to um, sort of analyze your website or your uh, Yes, yeah, that's yeah, the uh, wave. Oh, yeah. okay. You're going it's this. Um, say, I don't have the hard <laughs> <that. laughs> The web accessibility evaluation tool. Yeah. Yes. So you can go here and put your URL in. If you do it for the, the front page of the Manito site, it's interesting, right? But again, we don't have a lot of control over that. We, leaving Fred out. <laughs> so I'm actually logged in, so it's gonna. Well, in any case, I can show you with the, the admin page what it does. So it shows you a picture of your site and it has these little tags in here that tell you either what you're doing correctly or what you're not, right? Again, you know, the editors can't really fix any of this stuff. This is dependent on the developers doing their job well and they mostly do and Omeka is aware, right, of accessibility issues and they have an accessibility statement for the software. So um, that's why I didn't want to I didn't want to spend too much time on this, but you definitely can do this with any site you want if you if you care about how it how it comes out in here, what kind of score they get, and that's linked here in the workbook. What other questions? Great. Okay. So, what happens next? Is that rhetorical, or are you wondering who's who's in the group? Sure. Should I introduce you? <laughs> this is Alan. She's going to talk to you about. You know, actually, I don't know. Did you guys talk about privacy issues at all? A little bit. A little bit? Okay. Do you need the computer? No.
waiver needs to be amended for parental signatures because they can't give consent. Right? This is the, the bear trap of my life. 